Before we get into the episode, we want to take a moment to address the June 24th Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. This decision stripped away the legal right to have a safe and legal abortion. Restricting access to comprehensive reproductive care, including abortion, threatens the health and independence of all Americans. This decision could also lead to the loss of other rights. To learn more about what you can do to help, go to podvoices.help. We encourage you to speak up, take care, and spread the word. Darkcast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. What's up, y'all? I just want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up. The audio sounds a little wonky this week because... I fucked up. Well, Dana just wanted all the attention, so it was only her mic that she recorded. I didn't record. Well, I did record Cindy and Nydia and our guest, but uh, then I promptly deleted it. (laughs) Well, no, 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 not deleted it. She deleted us. I deleted everybody's but myself um, because I guess I'm the actual narcissist on the show. (laughs) Thank you. Finally. (laughs) Some truth. I've finally admitted it. So uh, bear with us this week. I didn't want to lose the whole audio because there's... uh, gold in them there hills so (laughs) enjoy the rest of the show warning the following podcast may occasionally contain strong language and material that is not suitable for all ages if you are easily offended it is highly advised that you turn back now however if you're a degenerate welcome brethren you've found your home We're a Jersey podcast, and on the menu is a variety of true crime, cults, mysteries, historical hilarities, and all sorts of weird stuff that we like. We do this with a dinner with friends theme. I'm Nydia. I'm Dana. And I'm Cindy. And today, joining us for the first time ever, (laughs) we got an exclusive. My daughter Natalie is here. Say hi, Nat. Hello. Joining us for dinner and maybe a little chat, and then she's got to see Natalie. Oh, okay. She thinks she has to speak. She thinks so. All right, we'll see how it goes. Maybe you can entice her. I have a very interesting story, so maybe yeah. she'll want to stay Listen, in here. Last week, I told you a story that was nearly the perfect crime. Yes. Wouldn't you say? Yes. A crime so sinister. <laughs> what do you have? I don't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going blank. Like, that guy that, that killed his wife with the hammer in the back of the head. Gotcha, gotcha, oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This other guy okay. could have been good for it. Yeah. Anyway. A crime so sinister that he would have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for those pesky ex-girlfriends. Just the one, I think, right? Just the one. No, it was just the one, but you know what? One is enough. One is enough, yeah. And you have an ex-girlfriend? That's right. You no longer have a secret. I think I destroyed that quote last week about Ben Franklin being like, you know, more than two people sharing a secret. I still don't know it, so I'm going to keep trying to say it. She wants to put names. I want to keep saying I know smart things, but I I simply don't. She wants to make sure that you know that she knows a Ben Franklin (laughs) quote that she doesn't really know. She reads. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so today, what what story are you going to share with us? So last year for Pride, I told you the story of Harvey Milk, an American politician and the first openly gay man elected to an office in San Francisco. Right, he really wanted everybody to come out. Yes, right, exactly. So this time around, I would like to discuss some of the things Harvey Milk did to further along queer rights and whether the ends justifies the means. Okay. I, I was hoping you would do this because today I saw a, you know, a TikTok. I mean, mm. this a TikTok. The only newsworthy here. source. Yeah. The only newsworthy <laughs> source. And they, it was a little, a little one minute thing about Harvey Milk and about how he essentially believed that everyone should come out. Absolutely. And basically pushed people right out. Right out of the closet. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so how unfair is that? So anywho, we're going to we're gonna tell you that story. But first, the food. Let us pray. Bless us, O patrons, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy donations through Patreon every month under the power of the V podcast. podcast. Cult. Okay, so it's like rolled up meat with something inside of it. Yes. Is this a brisket? It's not a brisket. I already made brisket not too long ago. So this is beef brujol over creamy polenta. I want to like polenta. I've never had polenta. polenta. Cornmeal. Sort of like grits a little bit, okay. but like creamier a it's little. definitely creamier. This has Parmesan in it and it's savory. You probably had cornmeal as a little kid, but it was sweet and sugar and buttery. With the farina? Yes. 
But that's like sort of. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, have you ever had grits? It's oh, more. Yeah. It's more of a thick version of. A farina, yeah. Yeah, this is very creamy, though. Okay. This one's very creamy. Um, so beef brujol mm-hmm. is a uh, flank steak rolled up with with spices and stuff in between. Okay. In I have rolled it up, got it, got it ready to go with a nice tomato sauce going on top of over the polenta, and that's what you're eating. As I did last year, I used the recipes from uh, LGBTQ chefs. I was gifted the Tasty Pride book, which features LGBT chefs. This particular recipe came from the book. (laughs) Anna Hieronymus and Elise Cornett. This recipe will always hold a special place in my heart. I remember walking home from my new job managing a shop in the West Village, totally overwhelmed by the responsibilities it required, and eager to see Elise for a quiet night at home. While I opened the door to the apartment, a waft of roasting garlic filled my nose and I spotted lit candles and a set table. As appreciative as I was of her efforts, I was in no state to be romantic and felt I would let her down. She handled, handed me a glass of wine and asked about my first day. I began to cry almost immediately, sharing how difficult it had been. Instead of feeling frustrated that her plans for a romantic evening had been thrown off course, she listened, encouraged, and consoled me, reassuring me that the dinner she'd made and the night she'd had in mind could wait. It was then that I knew that I loved her. Hours later, after she had helped me shake off the day, we dug into the dinner, forks into the pot of tender meat with warm tomato sauce. As comforting as Elise was to me, the dish was also to my belly. This recipe will always remind us of that night, the night Anna fell in love with Elise. Aww. That's so sweet. That's very sweet. Very. I'm so hungry for this. (laughs) Well, I can't wait to try it. Yeah. Did this recipe have a name, by the way? Beef brujol. Okay. (laughs) Uh, so didn't she just tell you that I never listen? Yeah, it seems like a common theme. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair, fair point. Anyways, fair point. That? So beef brujol over polenta. I am into it. I never had polenta, and I definitely am a polenta fan. What? Haven't we had polenta on this podcast? No. No, are you no, sure? I've never made polenta. All I right. apologize to myself. I will not because I'm sure we've had it on this podcast. <laughs> I did not make polenta. Okay. So if you made it before I, I feel like we had a conversation about polenta versus grits, blah, no, blah, blah. We've had because I said that I never had grits. And she said that, yes, we definitely had grits and we had. Okay, maybe I'm thinking about grits. So you're thinking about I'm going to Google so it. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure somebody did. Google it. <laughs> Um, the time that Nid said that <laughs> I grits don't love the grits, right? Okay. Because of the grittiness. I'm obsessed with your sentence structure and the <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> you don't like the grit of the grits. Like sand fell into polenta. Because polenta is beautiful mm. and creamy. Yes. Beautiful and creamy, like a very creamy mashed potatoes that is like super creamy <laughs> and has expensive cheese in it. Yeah, I'm into polenta. I love it. Okay. I would like wash my hands with it. Like I'm obsessed with it. I need, I love need it. a few more times with polenta. But yeah. Yes, definitely polenta. It goes rice, mashed potatoes, polenta, everything. Not to be like weird, but I was literally about to like list mashed potatoes over polenta, and I think I would go polenta over mashed potatoes. Really? I was really about to be like, I think polenta just comes in a smidge higher than mashed potatoes for me. Wow. Yeah, Dana, that's and I fucking love mashed potatoes. That's a hot take. <laughs> that's that a hot is, take. That is a hot take. You're saying it with your whole ass. Voice. I know. I'm. I feel confident about it. I. I really love polenta. Wow, that's her truth. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Now, could you freeze and deep fry mashed potatoes and make them fries? I mean, I guess you could. You might as well just have French Literally. fries. But. <laughs> Well, but, well, that's what smiley fries are. They're okay. Like they're mashed potatoes inside, and then they're, like, lightly Okay, because that's what I was saying. I had polenta fries before, and I could just, like, Bugs Bunny, like, ging, 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 like, with the carrot. It's right. so good. But now I'm like, can you do that with mashed potatoes? I guess you can. I guess you could just regularly have yeah. a French fry also. Maybe first, I think. Uh, maybe. Anyway, I love polenta. The meat was really tender and delicious what was it It was just a tomato sauce with just a tomato sauce Mm -hmm. the flavoring came from the filling of the meat oh Mm -hmm. i love the filling of the meat (laughs) (laughs) you're an idiot (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, truly. <laughs> this was a, a very, like, this is a, a dish that I would love in the fall. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, yeah. I love it right now. Don't get me wrong, but. It's good fall, now, too. It's very hurdy. Hard it's hurdy. Hard yes, hurdy. it's hurdy. <laughs> hurdy, hurdy. <laughs> I almost finished my drink. Okay. <laughs> You're like the pattern. Swedish chef. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we drinking? We are drinking a purple bunny. Ooh. If you look at it, it kind of looks like purple. It kind of looks black. It kind of <laughs> looks like black. black <laughs> but I thought... No, it, it ain't that purple. <laughs> exactly. And... It does not look like that at all. Maybe no. maybe it's the container. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I don't know if you guys like will agree to this, but it tastes like what I think the color purple would taste like. <laughs> yeah. It's so. I'm really glad it doesn't taste like Dimatap, which sometimes is what purple tastes like. Oh, oh fuck. Dimatap's like grape flavored medicine from like the 80s. Oh, the yeah, sort of, but yeah, yeah. When we were a kid, when we were kids, we had Dimatap and it was the most fucking disgusting flavored and when i was in, oh god i can just think about I have it a, a robitussin store i used to give her uh grape robitussin mm. yeah and one time <laughs> one time she like i was given it like i would have to like force her to yeah of course it, and um she like threw it up and it was like well you were little and you threw it up all over your bed and i was <laughs> it's the fucking worst and then i paid you back and then i paid her back when one new year's eve i got so drunk and i threw up on her uh monty python rabbit oh my Super. god they were so cute. <laughs> them. i Way back from when i was a child uh, truly I drank a grape flavored vodka at Game On one night and I took a shot of it. Someone was like, I don't like it. It's grape. And I was like, I love it. It's going to be so good. And I like drank it and it like went down my throat and hit my stomach. I was like, just kidding. And immediately came back up, <laughs> puked right on the floor. I was like, we got to go. <laughs> I he proceeded to puke a few more times then. Oh my God. That was a bad night. But this does not taste like that, thank God. But it does taste purple. Yeah. It does taste purple. Some things just taste like a color. Yeah. yeah. So this has uh, vodka, blue carousel, chambord, and cranberry juice. So that's, it's supposed to be purple. Blue and red not. make purple? It's Yeah, it's black. <laughs> it's not. And I tried multiple ways of trying <laughs> to get that purple. It, at like best, that. at best, this would make a great Halloween drink. Because it's right. so black. Yeah, right. It's good, though. It tastes good. Natalie's is purple, though. I think it's the glass. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, We're too. We're drinking out of mason jars, and Natalie's drinking out of a wine glass. Glass. She's yeah. our guest. <laughs> yeah. Well, I ran out of mason jars. I'm such jars. a diva. <laughs> <laughs> so something happened to me. Do <laughs> tell. You know how... I mean, is it going to be gross because we just ate? No, it's not gross. It has to do with the fact that I'm a, a rabid people pleaser. It's unfortunate. <laughs> so I was going away last week and I thought I want to get a, a bikini wax never had one before but I didn't want to get it at the spa because I don't need my friends at work seeing my fucking you know what I mean all my business <laughs> so I was like I'll just go to like a nail salon because they do it there right. whatever if you think of a bikini wax nail salon is well they do you know they wax your eyebrows they wax every, you know they, they ask you if you want to wax your mustache while oh your nails, yeah so. yes <laughs> so I got a bikini bottom because I was like it would stand to reason that you should wear a bikini bottom when you get a bikini wax because then they have like, I don't know, trace lines to like oh, where they can go. Yes, you know, yes. you know, that was my thought process. So I get a small pair because I wanted it to be smaller than the pair I was going to wear on the trip. You know, whatever. So I go in there and she's like, she said, oh, have you ever had a bikini wax before? And I said, no. And she starts hysterically laughing. And I was like, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, do I just, and she's like, yeah, take your pants off. So I take my pants off. She goes, no, no, take everything off. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so she had. So I take everything off and I'm like, M- probably she just does her own lines or something. I don't know. She was right, like, yeah. maybe they would get in the way. That kind of, okay. Makes right. sense. And like, whatever. So there's like paper on the table because you know that's like sanitary or whatever she's like i'm gonna take it all off and i was like oh well like i didn't mean i just wanted like a bikini wax and she's like it's better it's much better and i was like okay she upcharged it and i was like i just she 
After Jesus. once I was once I was fucking Donald Duck in it, there was not many times no, I was no. gonna be saying no. Okay, <laughs> everything she said when I was naked from the waist down, I was like, just do it. It's fine. Let's end this situation. <laughs> she fully got you, Donald Duck in it. I'm like, then proceeded. <laughs> hold on, talk about that phrase for a second. I've never heard that word, Donald Duck. In it. I was just wearing a shirt, but nothing from the waist. <laughs> Could be like, like yeah, Porky Pig in it, Donald Duck, in it. Yeah. any of those. Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> so I'm fucking sitting there, just like you know, and she's like, I I'll spray this um, numbing spray. You want it? And I'm like, I think that's probably a good idea. Yeah. And <laughs> so she's. You know what? Can I just tell you that that numbing spray is about as effective as that spray that you would spray in your kids, like bedroom to like keep the ghosts away in the monster honestly i couldn't tell you because um I, it was all horrifying like all of it you're supposed to like with that numbing spray you're supposed to wait like 30 minutes oh fuck off <laughs> she, <laughs> she sprayed that shit and immediately started ripping fucking hair out <laughs> and, so she's like, you know, <laughs> so she's like, you know, just, I mean, fucking for, before she, she sprays me down. Right? right. And I'm like sweating. Like, I'm just like, Oh my God, what the fuck did I sound? And this bitch just starts like just pulling fucking wax, but just fucking uh, it had to pull the whole roll of wax. Um, the paper out, you know, that she's gonna the sheets of like cotton that she's it's gonna, muslin. okay, whatever the fuck it is. She's just just pulling it out like she was going to mop up the entire floor with it. I was like, oh, my God, what the fuck? She just puts the wax on, rips it off. She's like, are you okay? And I was like, actually, I'm okay. And then she's like, it's not going to be okay. <laughs> like, okay. So then she's like, you know, going to town. And I was like, this is a lot. It hurt. But it wasn't, you know, ridiculously unbearable. It was like, it was okay. At this point, I was like, not even really understanding what was about to happen to me <laughs> so then she just was like lift your leg up take your fingers and she like took my fingers and like put them basically where my butt cheek meets my leg and she's like pull this way and like everything was like so spread your butt cheeks Girl, it was not just my butt cheeks. Like everything, like got opened up, like a oh, cave, like oh. the cave of wonders. She said, she said I escaped it. <laughs> <laughs> they opened. She forced her to open the curtains. <laughs> this bitch then took no fucking. <laughs> this bitch <laughs> took hot wax and just like <laughs> all over me, and then just started ripping hair out. And I was like, Oh my fucking god! Oh my god! So then she's, she's done and she's like, here's this like baby oil. You have to like, you know, get it off. You're going to be sticky everywhere. And I was like, I mean, she did some stuff, but like (laughs) it was, I was sticky everywhere. And so she's like, okay, like stand up. Oh, before she stand up, she's like, we'll wax your face too. Chin, lip, eyebrow, everything. I'm like, I, I just was like, I don't get, I just stop waxing me. Like everything was, my eyebrows do look pretty great though. <laughs> like, everything, truly, from head to fucking toe. Inner thigh. Okay, I guess I don't care. Oh my God. I was like, I was fully sweating. So when I go to stand up, all of the paper that was on the table is stuck to my ass, all of it. And she just takes her hand and she goes, I get it for you. And she just start smacking my ass, getting the paper off, and I'm like, "Can you just fucking stop, please?" Like, oh my god! Mind you, then I still had to get a manicure and a pedicure. I was only there for a pedicure. She talked me into a manicure. I have my fucking nails painted. Look at these bitches. They are pink. There's sparkles on my toes. She's like, "I'll put sparkles on. You'll love it." So then I was like, "I don't want sparkles on my finger." So finally, I'm like, "You know, my whole ass." I said, that. "Yeah, exactly." My whole ass cheeks and everything from my fucking back of my ass to my belly button is stuck together glued with wax okay <laughs> i'm sitting in the fucking chair and she's i'm like oh, you know what? i really like this color i don't want to have a spark just one finger you go one finger it's so pretty i'm like oh I don't, oh before i got up off the table after she's done waxing me she goes "Ooh, so pretty i was like no <laughs> like, don't she called her punani <laughs> yeah i was like Babe, I have a pretty vagina too. I have a lot of pants on. Oh my god, no, thank you. I was, <laughs> I was horrified. I was fucking horrified. Um. So anyway, two hundred dollars later. Uh, uh, yeah. Easy. Oh. Yeah. 
uh, with a tip because I had a tipper. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've had my first Brazilian wax, which I was not expecting. I'd not mentally prepare for that, but it happened. Oh my God. My friend went to go get a Brazilian wax and, um, she went to go get a bikini wax and the lady was like, you want a Brazilian wax? And she was like, no, cause I don't have any hair in my butt. She was like, yes, you do. <laughs> and she was like, no, no, I don't. I, I mean, I'm familiar with that area. No, I don't. And she, she was like, she was like, let me, let me show you. Yeah. And she did the, the, the wax. Yeah. She ripped it out and she was like, Nidia has so much hair. <laughs> so much hair. <laughs> She was like, she just showed me the strip. Yeah. So much. But, like, does she not feel it when she, like, washes her ass? I mean, like, I guess she didn't hair. think that it was a lot of, you know, like, you don't know how much oh, hair you have out there. Oh, oh I, I hope you're not eating while, while listening No one eats during also, this podcast. <laughs> Also, the regrowth is always the problem. It's the regrowth. Uh, so I'm, like, almost a week out, and it hasn't grown in at all. And I'm, like, kind of digging it. Like, a lot, actually. <laughs> I'm like, I might actually do it again. It doesn't really grow back until, like, the second or third week. I'm, I'm into it. Because that was the reason I got it, because I didn't want to have, like, you know, bumps or anything right. when I look, was on the beach, which it also rained the entire time I was in Mexico, so, like, oh, no. pointless, truly. The whole thing was fucking pointless, but... Um, I, I had... I, I used to get bikini wax... The Brazilian waxes. Oh, and, my God. Um, and after one too many painful experiences, I just got it all lasered off. I will tell you, like, it wasn't as, like, painful as I thought it was going to be. Truly. Lasered and bleached, didn't you? <laughs> no, <not bleached. laughs> I, do not work in the porn industry. That would be a total waste of time. Um, but yeah, I did get, I did, I, I got fully lasered. I know way too much about your vagina. <laughs> Truly. Like, we all do. <laughs> I mean, at one point it was your home. Yeah. Gross. I've since been evicted. <laughs> many, many years ago, actually. Yeah. Well, I've also been waxed at a nail salon. Um, I'll never forget her. In the, in, the same, her. in the same way that um, you despise names, I'll call her Pivet. And, um, yeah, I was like, and I even told her, I was like, be gentle, please. And she was like, sure, Was she the honey. one that called your uh, vagina pretty? Yeah, she did. Oh, that was like the second time because I'm a glutton for punishment because I went back to her. <laughs> um, but it was like my 21st birthday. And um, like maybe like the day before, I was like, oh my God, I got to get like a, a wax. So I got like a full Brazilian wax and she was yanking it. She was Ugh. yanking the muslin strips off like it was a magic trick. Yeah. She was like pulling something out of a hat. And I'm like, aren't you supposed to like hold the skin a little bit? She's like, no, it's fine, honey. Ripping it. I'm like, I was seeing stars. And then like, um, you can close your ears for this part. Um, you know, it was my birthday. So I was... Um, Trying to be intimate, <laughs> which I was. I don't know if it I could have. Like I had fillers in my vagina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like after that, I couldn't sit right for like. Four days. I don't know how you could have possibly, because I was like sore for like at least two days well, after. I mean, you didn't have sex afterwards. No, I would not have. <laughs> like, I don't know how you could have. I like iced it and everything because I, I was at a hotel and I had my um, my best friend Maria I was like, give me like ice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have had my boyfriend. I had somebody go grab me ice. And I like sat there. Like, I'm like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. This is no, all no, going to no, be no. fine. I was still touch starved because I think I had just had my period too. So I'm like, well, let's go. <laughs> and the next day, I like, like got up and used the bathroom. I like wiped. I'm like, oh my god. And um, wait a minute, yeah. is touch starved a nice way of saying horny? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> Sit or do anything, and I went back to her. And she's like, "Hey, honey, I'm like, Hi. I'm like, I'm back." And then she told me I have a pretty vagina. I'm like, Thank you. 
That was the, that was the most awkward part. I don't. I think this is all bad. All of this is a problem. And also, maybe next time leave just like a little bit of a strip because this is else. very juvenile looking. <laughs> it was really would not. Oh, because you like, got it all. It's all gone, and I was like, please don't do that again. <laughs> you know I went yesterday, and um, I was like so scared because I hadn't gone in a while, and I was like shaving, but I was like so scared to get like waxed because if you like shave. Yeah. After waxing, it hurts so much more. Like if you, it, it's like a, the first time again. So I was like too busy oversharing with the wax lady, distracting <laughs> myself to tell her that I don't want it like completely. Yeah. Because I don't want to look like a child. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, it's alarming actually. Like, okay, Donna, like look down. I'm like, it's gone. Because like, <laughs> <laughs> so, she didn't listen to you. I didn't say anything. Uh, <laughs> so I like totally forgot because I was just so scared, but. No, it was great. I would say go, don't go to a nail salon. Yeah. Take away. Well, so my coworker, well, I don't know. I guess my coworkers do, do Brazilian waxes, but I just, that feels, it feels like a level I really don't think I'm going to cross with no my coworkers. Shame. I like, literally, she's like, oh, okay, just, you know, take your pants off. I'm like, literally, like if I had tear away pants, <laughs> I'm, like, so, I'm so comfortable with uh, Donald ducking it. I don't refer to it as just like Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> yeah. Donald Duck was referring to your vagina as like a bee. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've never heard the vagina reference. <laughs> 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 wait a minute. <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> When Natalie lived at home, when she was a teenager, Natalie would do waxing on her friends. So I... Did share that? Oh, yeah. I still, I still do when they're around. I, I have a wax pot here, and I do, like, my own face sometimes. No, she would do... Pres- but I don't think I could I only, do that. Listen, i only done that for my one friend, and she's, like, my best friend. Yeah. We've seen each other's vaginas, you know? That's- yeah. She does Sometimes you need a good friend like that, you yeah. know? I'm comfortable. There was, like, a thing on TikTok where, like, girls were asking their best friends, like, oh, will you wax my asshole just to see what they would say? And the amount of them were that were like, yeah, of course, like, without question. Yeah. <laughs> was just like, oh, okay. I would not wax your asshole, so don't ask. No, I think that that <laughs> that is, like, a level of – I think you would ra- wax Rachel's asshole. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I would wax anyone's <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Thing then, just because I have to sprinkle this in there. Maria has waxed my vagina. Shout out Maria. Um, she has waxed my vagina before, and she also told me that I had a pretty vagina. So that's very validating. Wow. That, that is very validating. I... Yeah, she, she actually went, wow, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's a pretty vagina? Does she have long eyelashes? She Not anymore. Pouty lip? <laughs> you know? Not anymore. Okay? Yeah. She may now have a pouty lip. <laughs> <laughs> pair of them. <laughs> Let's have dessert, I guess. Yes. Yes. It's a multi-layer cake, I think. Mm-hmm. Chocolate it's cake. Chocolate mm-hmm. cake. Is it a chocolate cake? It is a chocolate cake. Oh. Wow, good guess, Ned. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dark chocolate mousse. What's mousse that? cake. Case. It's a cake. dark chocolate <laughs> mousse cake. Got there you it. go. This was also from the Tasty Pride book. Got it. Featuring another LGBTQ chef. This person is called Bill Yosis. And they were actually the pastry chef for the White House. Oh. Apparently, they were a pastry chef for during Obama and all that time frame. Oh. Oh, Obama's pastry chef. Well, the White House pastry chef. So, I think they did multiple years gotcha so yeah. this is like as close to the white house as we're gonna get speak for yourself <laughs> <laughs> so there you go there you have it and i'll just serve it up for you all right let's go how do you feel about obama's chocolate cake this was a very rich cake mm-hmm. and this, this is the thing i have a love-hate relationship with um rich desserts yeah. Um, I love that they're so rich that you just need a little bit of the dessert Definitely. to like freaking satisfy your sweet tooth. But I am disgusting and <laughs> I love to overdo things. And yeah. this dessert, I still haven't finished. I will eventually finish it. Uh-huh. But it's one of those things that you, very small amount because it's so rich. And I'm not like a big chocolate fan and this was very chocolatey. But... 
I felt, and I've said this a million times, this needed ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can taste the rum extract or whatever. It's not bad. It just like, right, it's like yes, a, it's can. a strong, not even a strong taste. It's it's a, a forward flavor. It gives it like a bitter chocolate taste. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like but I, but I do like this cake. I'm a little full from the polenta because I was like eating all of my beef and polenta. But this cake is good. I like it. It's super moist and Many layers with ice cream, which I really dig. I mean, not ice cream, icing. Really rich cocoa flavor. It does, yeah. And I think that rum extract really brings that out. It's, and it's not rum extract. It was straight up dark rum. Oh, fuck. I thought you said <laughs> rum extract. Okay, well, that's why. Then it's so forward, yeah. Rum extract real? I don't know. I thought she she said that. That's why. I was... Oh. I want to say there is a thing that says rum extract. That's Probably. I've seen it before. Yeah. Maybe for like non alcoholic people that can't have it for their cakes or something. I'm just making know. shit up. I don't know. Yeah, what the fuck do I know? Hard, but believe it or not, a lot of extracts actually are made from alcohol, alcohol. based. Yeah. yeah. It's probably fine. I remember the episode of Family Ties when the brother comes and he's an alcoholic and he goes through their freaking pantry and he drinks all their vanilla. Oh, that's <laughs> foul. Well, I you might as well drink the fucking NyQuil or something. He did that too. Okay, fair. Uh, so. Uh, I've got a bourbon vanilla extract that I got from another podcast and I'm dying to use it, but I want to use it for the right recipe. I almost bought you a tequila vanilla. She said bourbon. I know, but I almost, oh. for, in Mexico, I almost bought a tequila based vanilla or a Mexican vanilla that was like, I don't know, fucking tequila. But anyway, it was in a tequila store, but I almost bought that for you. But then I bought us to actual tequila instead. I prefer the big te- bottle like- of tequila. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that agave tequila. Was- yes, I tried many tequilas. I had chocolate tequila and vanilla tequila and and coconut tequila. But then this agave tequila just literally was so smooth. I was like, oh, that's the one. Mm-hmm. That's the one. And this is El Compadre. It's delicious. The Godfather. Oh, okay. Isn't it all tequila made with agave? That's what I was about to say. <laughs> I don't- no, not all tequila is made with agave. They're made from they're different ones. Uh, there's agave and then there's mezcal. mezcal. But yeah, mezcal is not considered a tequila, though. Oh, really? No, because they kept being like, "Do you want mezcal or do you want?" I mean, this? technically, it is, but they say that it's not a tequila because it's not made with blue agave. Oh, I don't know. This one's a hundred percent agave. Tequila snobs, you know. I the guess. more you know. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I didn't retain a ton of information when they were saying it to me, <laughs> but I was trying. Well, anyway. The cake is good. The tequila is good. The alcoholic drink is good. I feel good about this meal. I always feel good about these meals. Yeah? Yeah. Every time? Every time. Without fail? We're going to have to put her to the test. The most memorable meal that I've ever had was that one burger that I ended up getting married to. Mm. We're, we're trying to start a family. My cousin asked me to become an officiant so I can marry them, marry her. Oh, Sarah, who was on... Our podcast, many like one of the first episodes of our podcast, she's getting married to her fiance. They're getting married, and she asked me to be an officiant. And I was like, Why are you? I don't know. <laughs> well, initially, she asked me if I would do it in a dinosaur costume, which of course I was like, Yes. <laughs> but her husband, her fiance said no. <laughs> Oh, he's actually taking a serious. I guess. Marriage is a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a sacred thing. I yeah. come on, a dinosaur costume. How fucking hilarious would that be? Uh, that's <laughs> Dana. That is fucking. This is the exact kind of wedding that I want. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. But Ryan said no, so I have to like be normal about it. Which I was like, I fine, I guess. Ryan is not. Ryan's no enough. fun. Ryan is no fun. What the hell, Ryan? Why are you taking this marriage seriously like Could that? Could you imagine if I was like in an inflatable dinosaur costume with like the church, the <laughs> preacher thing that he wears around his shoulders? Like a small T-Rex arm. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm like holding a mini like little book, <laughs> like a little sunny Bible. <laughs> Come on, that'd be so funny. I'm going to talk him into it. <laughs> There could be two ceremonies here. Oh, God. There could be two. Hilarious. There could be a serious one at the court. and then the Yeah, th- let the judge marry you. I mean. <laughs> this is just for fun. Efficient? Yeah, I said I would do it. I'm going to be a priest. That's me now. Gonna I'm going to be <laughs> I'm a gay priest. <laughs> that's a, that could be a thing. You're an efficient. Yeah. You're an efficient. I'm going to be a... Can I be a priest though? I'm gonna be a priest. I you're gonna. I'm marry, gonna be a preacher. You're gonna marry so many people. I'm gonna I do think all. You them. actually have to go through like schooling to become a priest. Whatever, I'll be an officiant. <laughs> There's got to be a term that I'll that I approve of. You're a pastor. I'll be a pastor. <laughs> pastor. 
I deserve with the with the religious trauma I have. I deserve to be a pastor. Okay. Well, here's the thing, though. I'm gonna go around marrying we people. Take on the uh, characteristics of our. That's right. Of our what, what, oppressors. oppressors. That's right. And that's what you're trying to do. That's what I am we trying to do. I'm on a mission. Cult. That's right. I'm gonna be ordained. Oh, an ordained minister. That's me. That's, that's what it's you. called. Yes, a minister. In a dinosaur costume. Yes. Always, <laughs> yes. I'm gonna make a website where I'm like, I will marry you in a dinosaur costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm gonna hold you to this. Oh well, I'm here for it. I'm excited about it. I'm gonna be a minister. Now that we're on this subject, this drink does taste suspiciously like Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> well, Welcome to the cult. cult. <laughs> <laughs> You've been indoctrinated. <laughs> Wait, did you want to tell us about your diabetes? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I was recently diagnosed as having pre-diabetes uh-huh i don't know if i've mentioned that a hun- a about a hundred times <laughs> <laughs> i don't agree but sure I might as she eats the chocolate cake don't cut me too big a piece i have diabetes <laughs> <laughs> i'm pre-diabetic <laughs> i may have mentioned it once or twice but you guys are exaggerating as usual <laughs> So I went to the doctor today and so she, I said, listen, I have not slept like more than a few hours, like in six months. And at first I thought it was like part of the grieving process, you know, yeah. like I thought it, that was it, but no, this has entered into a zone that I'm no longer comfortable with. She almost got excited. She got a glint in her eye. Yeah. Oh, I get to ask these questions. So she pulls up the depression page <laughs> okay. and she's like, well, are you feeling hopeless? or worthless. At first I was like, well, aren't we all in these times? <laughs> yeah. And I like, kind of like, matter of fact, <laughs> and then she asked me another question. She's like, are you having thoughts of, of, of death? You know, are you having like, you know, constantly? And I'm like, yeah, all the time, all the time, like, because I have a true crime podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. And I was like, yeah, so I think about dying a lot, like all the time. And um, also, I'm a teacher. So, yeah, that's always in the back mm-hmm. of my mind. But I'm not, like, trying to, like, cause it for myself. Right. I'm just trying to avoid it. So, okay, she's like, okay. Like, she was kind of like, almost like, <laughs> <laughs> she moves on to the next. So, it's like all these questions. She's like, is your mind racing? And I'm like, yeah. I struggle with cat ownership. Because <laughs> I think I'm going to go get a cat. But I don't like cats. And I'm never going to get a cat. But I always think that, like, in my mind, I'm going to get a cat. So it's like crazy thoughts, right? So I'm like, yeah, that's probably crazy thoughts. And she's like, are you seeing a therapist? And I was like, well, yeah. But I don't feel like she has anything to work on me. And she's like, you got to kind of give it a little bit of time. <laughs> Long story short, she's like, um, I think you might need antidepressants. <laughs> And I was like, well, I don't want those. And she's like, she's like, well, why, why don't we? Like, she's like, I could not this. imagine being your fucking doctor. She's like, I'm going to fill this prescription. Her there. <laughs> she's like, fill it if you want. Yeah. Wait two weeks, think on it, and then fill it. Or, you know, she's like, and then we can talk about it. She's yeah. like, do it for a month, and then we can talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I don't want any medicine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very boomer esque of you. I, like, I just don't want to put any foreign. Or raise myself body. up on my bootstraps. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm like. I don't want to put anything artificial into my body. Bitch. No microchips for me. <laughs> no, no, no. I want all the microchips. But um. But I was just like, but I did replace all sugar with Splenda. And I'm like, gross. Do you hear <laughs> gross. Like, That's the grossest so thing. Feminine. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's where I'm at mentally. I feel, um, I think this is good for you. I think it's good for you. But I know, truly. I was like saying that to my aunt. She came with us on vacation. I was like, you guys were just like, sure, have a baby at 19 (laughs) and just like, let me raise it and like, let me go off on my own. Like, what the fuck were you guys thinking? Like, you were just like, have a kid. That's fine. This is fine. And I was like, it's going to be fine. And then like, Somehow it ended up being fine, but like that was fucking rocky waters there for a while. That was dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. That was dangerous of you. I feel better. I had her at 20. Yeah. It's kind of crazy, right? I was like, oh my God. Don't let me forget it. (laughs) I don't like age forget it either. So (laughs) it's fair. 
I, she'll let you know all the wrong things I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I came in when Gage was had some friends here last week, and I came in and they were talking about all of the punishments that they got as children from their parents, and I was like, this feels like a dangerous conversation. <laughs> I want to walk away from it. I don't want to be a part of it at all. I think you're going to be fine. And uh, I think you should take the meds, but I'm a professional. So. I think we should start a GoFundMe for you, though. <laughs> <laughs> for what? For your journey. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you this about sleep. Like, in my experience, the more I don't sleep, the worse I don't sleep. Like, when I don't sleep, I get into this vicious cycle of, like, I can't sleep. And, like, I didn't sleep the night before. I'm definitely not going to be able to sleep tomorrow. And, like, it does really just take, like maybe a Xanax or maybe something that just like gives you one good solid night of sleep. Yeah. But I have to go to work with special ed. Well, no, maybe take it on a Friday, yeah. you know, and then you have the whole weekend to like sort of recover from it or like something that just gives you like that breaks that cycle because like mentally you get like, I'll sit in bed and I'll just be like, when I was in third grade, I said this weird fucking thing. And like, I bet they remember oh, it. You know what I mean? And like, I, I do that shit. Like, all the time. Those pervasive thoughts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. All the time. I would suggest an edible. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm you didn't hear that. <laughs> no, I definitely. That wouldn't work do, for me. I can't do any marijuana. Yeah. Because my mind would race the entire Yeah. Race. I'm not saying from experience. I'm just saying. it would. I would have to do like eat the edible and then fall asleep before it kicked in before it's a, uh, because I'm a thinker. See, from what I've Mm-mm. heard. Oh, from what you heard? From what I've heard. Right. <laughs> theoretically. Theoretically. Mm. Uh, an edible just before you're about to knock out. Keeps you. Yeah. Keeps you knocked keeps, out. Keeps you knocked out. That's not been my experience. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from the, from the research I've gathered. <laughs> yeah. I've never. Um, from the research I've gathered, that would not be the case for me. I think biologically, you know, mm. my blood type or whatever. <laughs> yeah, your blood type. Yeah. So you have a story for us. I do have a story for you. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. I'm CJ, host of Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. My episodes focus on crimes committed by and against the LGBTQ community. I've covered cases you probably have heard of, such as Matthew Shepard, Brandon Tina, and the Orlando Pulse nightclub massacre, as well as some lesser-known cases like the murder of Ray Hainish, the Australian gay beat murders, and the suspicious disappearance of Lisa Lynn Stone. I cover cases brought to me by listeners like Penny Brummer, who I believe was wrongfully convicted. Taboo cases such as lesbian corrective rape and murder in South Africa and pray the gay away camps. I discuss gay serial killers, women who pretend to be men to hook up with other women and trans murders. I'm opinionated and uncensored. I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but surely I'm someone shot at tequila. No matter what your gender or orientation in life might be, Please join me as I tackle rainbow crimes in search of unicorn justice. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. So today I got my story from all that's interesting.com, LA Times. Uh, YouTube, a few different Wikipedia articles, and the Ford Library Museum. So let me start out the story with Gerald Ford. He was the 38th president of the United States from 1974 to 1977, and he was the only president to never have been elected to office as the president or the vice president. Apparently, when Nixon was president, his VP, Spiro Agnew, pled no contest to like accepting bribes when he was a governor. So Gerald Ford moved up to VP and then Nixon fucking resigned and Ford moved up to president. Like he wasn't even, it was destined. yeah. When he took the VP's job, he was like, Oh, this will be a good way to like end my career, you know, as the VP, right. like he wasn't planning on running the following year, but right. Nixon, you know, whatever. Kind of sounds like Biden. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> 
It's not a, a fucking liar. <laughs> I mean, liar. Biden ran though. Biden ran. Not will. <laughs> but so so. Like walked. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, people didn't fucking like this guy. Like people did not like him. One of those people was Lynette Squeaky Fromm. She was one of the Manson girls who did not go to jail with the rest of the Manson family when they committed yeah. the, the Manson crimes. So some people believe that she hated that she wasn't with her family, quote unquote. And so that's why on September 5th, 1975, she pointed a Colt 45 handgun at Ford and pulled the trigger, but she had never chambered a gun into the, I don't know, gun a talk, bullet, but a, a bullet. bullet into the chamber. Uh-huh. So when she fired the gun, nothing came out. A, a flag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right. yeah, truly. <laughs> <laughs> but she was able to use that as being like, I was just trying to threaten him. I wasn't, oh, you know, but I was going to say all of the arrests, none of them. <laughs> yeah. No, she did go to jail actually for like a, like 35 That's years or something. Yeah. All of the arrests. Yeah. None of the freaking backing. So a secret service agent grabbed the gun and took a squeaky into custody. And, you know, she, she was later convicted. The first person ever to be convicted of attempted assassination of the president and was sentenced to life in prison. She was paroled on August 14th, 2009, after serving 34 years. Only 17 days later, on September 22nd, 1975, Gerald Ford was leaving the St. Francis Hotel in downtown San Francisco when Sarah Jane Moore, standing in a crowd of about 3,000 onlookers across the street from the hotel, fired a 38 caliber revolver at Gerald Ford, missing him by like five inches, like barely missed him. Damn. Before she had the chance to fire a second round, retired Marine Oliver Sipple grabbed the gun and deflected her shot and the bullet struck a wall and um, ricocheted off and hit a taxi driver who was only slightly wounded. He he didn't die. I know what story you're telling. What? I know what story you're telling. Go ahead. I, I, the, the retired Marine did it for me. Okay. So Moore was later sentenced to life in prison and she was paroled uh, December 31st, 2007 after serving 32 years. Oliver Sipple is the man I want to tell you about today. I know you I know that's who it is. Yes. So Oliver Billy W. Sipple was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1941. He was part of a large devout Baptist family, one of eight siblings. Oliver had a complicated childhood. School was tough for him. He had some learning disabilities. And also he discovered at a very young age that he was gay. He knew that this would upset his very religious parents. So he hid his sexuality from his family. He eventually would drop out of high school and joined the Marines where he served in Vietnam. At the time, queer people were not allowed to enlist in the U.S. military. And furthermore, at the time, uh, there was an Air Force member named Leonard Matlevich, who was a Vietnam War vet and a race relations instructor and the recipient of a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star with a perfect record who purposely outed himself to try to get the ban on gays in the military lifted. Right. That's a whole nother very cool story that I like found because of this one. Just do a wiki search for him. The links are... That's gotta be like an amazing story. It's very interesting. Despite his exemplary military records, tours of duty in Vietnam, his high performance evaluations, the panel ruled that Matt Levitch was unfit for service and he was recommended for a general under honorable conditions discharge. When he refused to sign a document pledging that he would never practice in homosexuality again in exchange to be allowed to stay in the Marines. So there was like clauses within the air force that like, say you got drunk and fucked a guy, like we'll let you stay. Cause it was just like a one-time thing. And that's what they were trying to like f- give him a loophole. He's like, no, I'm like a gay guy. I have sex with men all the time. It's right. not because I was drunk one time. He was discharged and there was like this long lawsuit that went back and forth and he was reinstated after many legal battles and a bunch of back and forth in the courts and superior courts. And he was like given back pay, but like really at this point of years of being out of the military, like he lost his career. It was all fucked that up. Sucks. But that's another story. Like I think you should look into it because I think it's actually a very interesting story, but it's very understandable that people like Oliver 
would remain closeted while in the military because this kind of shit was happening all the time. So while he was in Vietnam, he suffered shrapnel wounds in December 1968, and he was sent to convalesce in a Philadelphia veterans hospital. He was released in March 1970, but he was declared permanently disabled due to his injuries. Like he would, he had what we would probably call combat PTSD now, but like was called shell shock back then. Right. He would spend like 4th of July's at the VA hospital because he couldn't like, the st- yeah, like the loud noises and he was just really traumatized. So as we know, San Francisco in the 70s had become a safe haven for many queer people across the nation who could not find acceptance in their own families. So Oliver had settled there and immersed himself in the developing queer scene. Here's something that I would love to know. Mm-hmm. I would love to know historically how uh, San Francisco became the hub of yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but San Francisco was also like where um, African Americans escaping the South found like a, a place of acceptance. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you can see like through history that California has always been a little bit right. Yeah, you know, so there must be something happening there that like okay, this is just me bullshitting, right? But like right. you know, when people would go across the Midwest and they'd be like mining for gold and shit, like right. they were always like. <laughs> Wait, why do they say like mining for? They were always like outlaws and yeah, like yeah. cowboys yeah, like and things. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that like they sort of had their own. They were like living outside the law. So it was probably easy. This is just me, right. you know, hypothesizing. But like, I mean, you're an expert. Yeah, you know, they were just like a bit outside the law. You know, it was easier for them to accept you know black cowboys or like queer people or whatever because right. you know that's just my theory. I just always thought it was interesting that that became like. That San Francisco specifically. specifically. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. We should, you should do an episode on it. I'd love to find out. That's all my list. <laughs> you know, he, he immersed himself in the queer scene there. He helped campaign for Harvey Milk during his election, who he had met a few years earlier in New York. Did he know Harvey Milk was out at the time? Yeah. He was campaigning? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Harvey Milk was like campaigning on like, equality for gay people right. and like he was like i'm a gay politician right. and, and just for the record dana did a story on harvey Milk, yeah which was fascinating while oliver may had been out to people he felt safe with in san francisco he was not out to anyone back in detroit like at all right. and of course this was like before facebook or any like his family would have never he would have never invited them to san francisco they would have never had a reason to know that he was out you know when he went back to detroit to visit his family he would just be a straight guy, a guy from the military, their brother, their son, you know, whatever. He basically lived two lives, but the safe closeted one would end for him with the heroism of the day he saved the president. So on September 22nd, 1975, Oliver Sipple went out on his usual walk around the neighborhood of Union Square in downtown San Francisco. And he saw a huge crowd of people and he had heard that the president was coming. So he thought, oh, I'll go hang out and see, like whatever. And it seemed like while Oliver had a bunch of PTSD or mental health issues and and physical health issues, he was trying to find like a community, you know, his own family, his his own friends and, you know, whether he was dating or whatever he was doing, he was doing that in San Francisco, like safely under that umbrella there. You know what I right, mean? Yeah. So he's standing in the crowd next to Sarah Jane Moore, and she raised her hand with a gun and shot at the president, missing him. And Oliver yelled she had a gun, and he went after her. Oliver said at the time, I saw her gun pointed out there, and I grabbed for it. I lunged, and I grabbed the woman's arm, and the gun went off. The bullet ricocheted and hit John Ludwig, a 42-year-old taxi driver, but he survived. Initially, Sarah Jane Moore and Oliver Sipple were both taken into custody because... Right. The chaos, chaos and nobody yeah. knew what was happening. But once they figured out that he was a hero, they began hounding him. The, when they first started running stories about him, they were saying how the retired Marine saved the president. He was such a hero. And he kept being like, no, 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 no. Don't say I was a Marine. Don't say my name. He would call the right. pro- Please don't say my name in the paper. Like, don't like, don't do that. Don't do that. And he insisted he was just doing what anybody would have done. He said, I'm not a hero. I'm a live coward. He told the press that it, it's probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me in my whole life. So I would recommend that you listen to the Radio Lab podcast. It was it's I love radio everywhere. Lab. You can find it anywhere. They did a great episode about Oliver Sipple and they interviewed Sarah Jane Moore. They interviewed Oliver Sipple's family. They interviewed the original reporters that outed him. They had a lot of really wow. cool people that they talked to that had some really interesting insight, you know, 40, 50 years later. 
Don't regarding the case. Up. I know, because it's so cool. So they talked to one of Oliver Sipple's nephews, and he reminisces how that his family had worked in the GM factory in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Like, his grandfather worked there, and his uh, Oliver Sipple's brothers, a bunch of them work there. And that the co-workers, you know, on their lunch break, they would, like, go to the bar and have beers, and, like, all the co-workers were like, your son's a hero, your brother's a hero, like, buying him drinks. They were so souped. They are so excited for the local hero boy, you know? Right. And that was until Harvey Milk outed him. So if you remember the episode we did last year, it's called Sounds Gay, I'm In. And I told you how Harvey Milk really wanted people to see that gay people were everywhere and that if straight people could just see us as regular people in their community, maybe they wouldn't be so scary and stereotypical, whatever, to them. And they we could just, like, live amongst them and, you know, be accepted. And, and in theory, this is a great – it's a great practice. Right, yeah. I'm going to play a little clip of Harvey Milk for you. To the gay community all over this state, my message to you is so far a lot of people joined us – and rejected Proposition 6, and now we owe them something. We owe them to continue the education campaign that took place. We must destroy the myths once and for all, shatter them. We must continue to speak out, and most importantly, most importantly, every gay person must come out. You must tell your immediate family, you must tell your relatives, you must tell your friends if indeed they are your friends, you must tell your neighbors, you must tell the people you work with, you must tell the people in the stores you shop in, you... Once they realize that we are indeed their children and we are indeed everywhere, every myth, every lie, every innuendo will be destroyed once and for all. And once once you do, you will feel so much better. In theory, right? Like, we understand Harvey's point, right? If we, if it was in a perfect world, in a perfect world, but that is certainly not what 1975 was or 1970, or, anything or, or 2022 or. even. Yeah. So we, I get it. I get what his point was. And, and Harvey had a terrible way of really just outing people, you know? So when Harvey heard that his friend Oliver had saved the president and that he was a hero, he thought this was a perfect opportunity to show the world that there are good gay people among them. According to the gay author and journalist Randy Schiltz, who wrote the book, The Mayor of Castro Street, The Life and Times of Harvey Milk, which is the movies made after this book, and right. you know anything we know, is, is a lot of that is from the book. Milk said, it's too good an opportunity for once we can show that gays do heroic things, not just all the caca about molesting children and hanging out in bathrooms. To be fair, Harvey was not the only person who outed Oliver. Two messages were left on the answering machine of San Francisco Chronicle columnist Herb Kane. One was from Harvey Milk, and the other one was from Reverend Ray Brochiers, who was the head of the gay activist group called the Purple... I'm sorry, called the Lavender Panthers. Which the Purple Panthers, come on. I mean... An alliteration. You uh, fucked up there. (laughs) Because it's gay, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) So they're Lavender Panthers. They did this in order to portray him as a gay hero, to break the stereotypes of homosexuals being timid and weak and unheroic figures. Again, in theory... I get your point, but like, we can't just fucking out people. So on that Radio Lab episode, they have audio recordings of the original journalist talking to Oliver Sipple in his home and asking him if he'll discuss the, the gay thing. And he's saying in the recording, no, I don't want to talk about it. Like, no. And so that coming out is like a big deal because he says to the, like, you can't do this. You can't talk about this. And they do it anyway. And the media, after his outing, the the headlines go from Marine Hero Saves the President to Gay Hero Saves the President. And these were not just San Francisco articles. They were 
LA Times, New York Times, in Detroit, his family finds out on splashed over the front headlines of the newspapers. So the problem is that Oliver moved 2,300 miles away from his family so they would never find out about his true self. And now it's on the front page. So Oliver's family went from being congratulated to being ostracized in the community, which is also fucked up, you know, like, so his mother called him and she told him that she couldn't show her face in church and that she didn't want to ever speak to him again. So the other interesting factor is that Gerald Ford was slow to thank Oliver for saving his life. Really? So normally, you know, he would get an invitation to the White House or like whatever. Days had gone by. He'd never heard from Gerald Ford. He never heard from the mayor of San Francisco. He never heard from anyone. And and he said that to the reporters when they came to his house. They were he's like, I haven't heard from anybody. Nobody said a thing to me. Except the police. Right. So Ford would later say that his slow response had nothing to do with not initially thanking uh, Oliver. He would eventually take the, the, the arduous task of sending him a letter in the mail. I mean, you can get a letter in the mail. Yeah. From the president. Right. But it just said, I want you to know how much I truly appreciate your selfless actions last Monday. The events were a shock to us all, but you acted quickly without fear to your own safety. By doing so, you helped advert danger to me and others in the crowd. You have my heartfelt appreciation. So Oliver would write the president back, and I thought maybe you'd want to read that letter. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Dear Mr. President, thank you for taking the time to write to me. In view of some of the events since the unfortunate attempt on your life on Monday, September 22nd, I really appreciate your publicly thanking me. As you probably know, there have been a number of stories concerning my personal sexual orientation in the news media. These stories have caused great anguish to my parents and to the rest of my family, I am sure. My mother hung up on me when I first called her after these stories began to be published. I know that you are concerned with very many matters which are too important and pressing for you to be concerned with the details of my private life. However, the unexpected and glaring publicity which has been given to my private life, has very seriously disrupted my family relationships. Mr. President, it is a very hard thing to have your mother and family not want to have any contact with you. Before she hung up on me, when I first called her after these stories began to be published, my mother told me that she could not go out her front door or even go to church because of these stories. I know that your schedule is heavily occupied, but I respectfully request that you take the time to see my family or at least call my family. The telephone number is blank, 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 blank. I love my family and I do not want to be separated from their love and companionship. Your help will be greatly appreciated. Respectfully, Oliver W. Stipple. That's so sad. Isn't that so fucking sad? Honey, I would still love you. Ger- How could you be a mother and not accept your child? <laughs> I mean, these are religious people in 1975, whatever the fuck it was. And and that shit still happens today. Mm -hmm. Every fucking day. That's fucking gross. How do you call yourself a mother? It broke him. It broke him. Clearly. He wrote to the fucking president to be like, can you please call my mom and tell her I'm okay? Like, you know what I mean? And tell her that I'm not gay and that I'm... Or that I'm a good guy and it's okay. Like, it's so fucking sad. That makes my stomach hurt. Gerald Ford ignored this letter, never reached out to his family. His family didn't even know that Oliver sent that letter until the the Radio Lab episode, and they read it to them on the air. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah, in, like, 2017. Was his mom still alive? No. No, we'll talk about that in a minute. Oliver would get a lawyer and go on to make a public statement that his sexual orientation had nothing to do with the events of the day and him saving the president. But that did not stop the media from hounding him. He was just like, the fact that I maybe he doesn't ever even say that he's gay. He's like, right. if I have brown eyes or if I happen to be gay or if I happen to whatever, it has nothing to do with the fact that I saved the president. Right. I care about life and I care about someone trying to take someone else's life. It was like, basically, like, please stop hounding my family. It was like all he cared about was like his family, his family, his family. Please stop saying this. Please stop printing this. Like, please. Right. And the media just would not fucking quit. Oliver would go on to sue the Chronicle, filing a $15 million invasion of privacy suit against a bunch of people. Seven names in the newspaper, the 
the author, uh, Herb Cain, and a bunch of unnamed publishers for disclosing his sexuality and costing him the relationship with his family. He was never able to repair the relationship with his family. His mother died, and his father would not allow him to attend the funeral. Oh, my God. Oh. That sucks. Yeah. The suit went on until May 1984 when the Superior Court of San Francisco would eventually dismiss the case when the State Court of Appeals held that Oliver Sippel had indeed become news and his sexual orientation was part of the story. And so they were basically like, it was entertaining and people deserve to know. They also, part of the argument was that Oliver was out in California. So that if he was out in California, it would stand to reason that everybody could find out that he was out. So like... Uh that, that was, like, part of it, right. which I don't agree. Maybe now in, you know, with internet the way that it is, like, I feel like kind of if you're out to anybody, you're out to everybody. But, like, I wouldn't say that that was the case in the 70s, you right. know? But, I mean, it also crosses the line of, you know, like, your personal information. Absolutely, kind of yeah. Well, that was the argument. Like, that was a big part and of the argument. Is like, like is your, is your sexuality co- connected to, like, any any type of, like, medical, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, this was way before, like, HIPAA was a so thing, but... that would but be, like, a HIPAA Sure, thing, yeah. But that would only, like, go behind, like, doctors disclosing that or medical professionals disclosing that. Not really. Maybe yeah, the... No. Well, maybe the media. I don't know if the media is allowed to... I, I don't know how that works. But Oliver's mental and physical health rapidly declined over the years. He began to drink heavily. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia, fitted with a pacemaker. The incident brought so much attention that later in life, while drinking, he would express regret for ever saving the president's life. On February 2nd, 1989, an acquaintance from the bar, because he had literally no one else except the people he drank with at the bar, Wayne Friday, found Sippel dead in his San Francisco apartment with a bottle of Jack Daniels next to him and the television still on. He had clippings of the day, you know, newspaper clippings of the day he saved the president around his house and the framed letter from Gerald Ford on his wall. San Francisco, the, the coroner, estimated that Sippel had been dead for about 10 days before someone found him. Oh, my God. He supposedly died of natural causes, and he was only 47 years old. There's nothing natural about that. He died sad and alone, and only 30 people attended his funeral. And it was not at Arlington Cemetery, which is where most what? military people should be buried um, or c- can be buried. Yeah. And Gerald Ford and Especially his... Especially a freaking military hero. Yeah, who saved, saved the, the fucking president. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, really. Yeah. Gerald Ford and his wife sent a letter to Oliver's friends and family saying that he strongly regretted the problems that developed for him following this incident. It saddened me to learn the circumstances of his death, his deepest sympathy. Mrs. Ford and I express our deepest sympathy in this time of sorrow involving your friend's passing. And like, fuck you. Like, you could have done that... 10 what? years before when he was asking you to do it, you know, exactly. like, and maybe it wouldn't have had to fucking turn out like that. Like how little, I mean, somebody just saved your stupid ass life that nobody right. even wanted it. After saved. two, fu- the second assassination attempt in 17 days, so shitty. like, what the fuck? Right. You could, the least you could have done is be, hey, family, hey, people. Hey man, this hey, guy's a hero. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Signed the president. Yeah. This letter would hang in the bar that he drank at for like years after he died. In 2001, an interview with columnist Deb Price, uh, Gerald Ford disputed the claim that Sippel was treated differently because of his sexual orientation, saying, as far as I was concerned, I'd done the right thing and the matter was ended. I didn't learn until some time later, I can't remember when, that he was gay. I don't know where anyone got the crazy idea that I was prejudiced and wanted to exclude gays. Fuck off. So this case is still highly debated in journalism courses and law reviews regarding the morality and the ethical implications of outing queer people, as well as the discussion around where citizens' rights to privacy begin. You know, so basically what people argue is that once he thrusted himself in the limelight, voluntarily or not right. to save the president it's like like what happens with celebrities all like off, every yeah. all of your information is you know right. is free game and so like there's a lot of like argument of whether where does that start and where does that end and what does that mean for people who are like trying to do the right thing and just save a guy who's about to get shot you know right well i think harvey milk's thought process of having as many people come out and as possible and show the world that we aren't a bunch of weirdos is a good idea. It would be great if we lived in a world where we didn't have to assume all people were straight, or it would be awesome in a world where 
no one had to come out. If you do want to come out, I wish for you a beautiful and unique experience with love and support for anybody that chooses to do so. But I want to remind people that only if it's safe and like if your family or home isn't safe or a safe space for you to come out, you are still queer. If you're in the closet, you are still valid and you are loved. And when you are ready and safe, there's a big old world of chosen family for you. And I swear to God, you'll find them. Don't come out if you don't have to or do. And it's cool and fun, but it's not always a safe and good thing for people. You know, that makes me think of um, countries like the Middle East, you know what I mean? Where you have people who have to live in, you know, stay in a closet, like... Girl, the Bible Belt in America. <laughs> yeah, I was literally about to say... No, but I'm just saying, like, okay, the Bible Belt, like, they'll disown you, but they won't necessarily kill... Your family won't necessarily kill you. In the Middle they East... Might. They well, could. Yeah, I'm just saying... I get what you're... I get you your point. If yeah, people will stone East, you to death. Yeah, like, you will... Like, someone just got... Your own mother, your own, you know, your own mother, your own... Yeah, that mom. just happened last year on TikTok. There was, and like, this... Just, yeah. kid that was stoned to death i mean there's countries that are just right there that still don't acknowledge it or it's still illegal like jamaica still not safe to be i have a friend who's here from trinidad and he can't be out to his family in in trinidad because he's like they'll kill you because really? yeah you don't really think about like those islands because you know you yeah know those islands on they're vacation, so fun and, so and it's fun, yeah right so free Zachary's yeah dad. right exactly yeah. but you don't really realize like you know I, you know, it's, I am like deep, deep, deep into queer TikTok, of course, you know, it's like fucking all I do. But, you know, I was watching, like, even kids who are like getting their education paid for by their parents, like they can't come out and like, don't fucking come out. Let them pay your college. Right. Just, just zip it out. It's okay. You're still queer. Like you don't, you don't have, cause I think there is this like pressure specifically in America because we're like such a free nation, you know, to be like, I, I have to come out and it's pr- gay pride and we have to be queer. And it's like, it's okay. You're, you're still queer in the closet. It's fine. Like when you're ready and when it's safe, like, I think that's so, so important. Like when I did that thing where I talked to those middle sc- or those little high schoolers about the, I talked to their little LGBT club, yeah. many of them weren't out and the, and the, teacher that was like conducting the the group she she must have said three times during that thing that it had nothing to do with me about coming out right. like, only when it's safe only when it's safe only when it's safe and i was like damn they're really like but making I mean, sure people suck. know that right, of course it fucking suck sucks to like live your romantic life and you know or not live your romantic life or yeah not, or not yeah not live your romantic life it, i don't love to like tell these discouraging pride stories i don't love to but i do think like the amount of people that know the harvey milk story i don't want to negate from what harvey milk did and i don't want to negate from like he he made moves and really pushed forward queer laws and you know whatever but like he did it with you know the shrapnel of of anybody around him that he thought that, I guess that was my question. Does the ends justify the means? You know what I mean? Oliver Sipple really took the shrapnel, you know, yeah. he, he, he was already struggling and then having this like thrust upon him was really fucked up. Cause it That's seemed like he was trying to build a life for him despite having PTSD, despite, right. you know, his family not being accepting like, okay, well, I'm going to, f- I found this queer space. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to participate in marches. Like there's pictures of him, like in, you know, in at pride marches and shit like that, you know, like. And we say, okay, we say, you know, only thirty people showed up to his funeral. But if you had a thirty, if you had thirty people that loved you, this is a man who I'm saved the president's you. life. No, I get that. I get. That. And Oliver Sipple went to Harvey Milk's funeral, even though, like, that was still like he still showed up to Harvey Milk's funeral. Like he's. Be that firm. Even though, yeah, he's just, I mean, he was still a good guy. They were saying that, like, he would show up, you know, he was on disability, so he would get his check at the first of the month. He would go to the bar. He was just just a straight alcoholic. He would go to the bar and, like, spend his entire check on everybody at the bar. Like, the people that came to his funeral were the his alcoholic friends from the bar, you know, it was like, it was very sad. They said that when like, they went to like, find out if he was in there, there was all these little post-it notes on the door because he made friends with his like elderly little neighbor. And she kept putting post-it notes on the door. Like, come check on me. I haven't seen you in a couple of days. And she kept putting notes on the door, but he wasn't probably knew that he was gay and didn't care. Yeah. She didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. It was sad. That was a sad. Thank you for that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Sorry I'm about it. to put out some um, information out there. So, uh, of course, Trevor Project uh, has their ch- Trevor Chats. 
there's the phone number, um, there's the text line for Trevor at 678-678. Of course, always the, the suicide hotline um, text messages, which is 741-741. Um, there's actually a trans lifeline. Mm. And, and I'm going to post this, um, of course, on, on our sites. But there is a trans lifeline for the United States and the can- and, and the Canada. Sorry, <laughs> and Canada on here on this site that I found. Um, so there's there's people to talk to. There's, Honestly, I love a text message. Like, yeah. if I could do everything by text messages, real, honestly, please and thank you. Which is why I mentioned those yeah. than I mentioned any of the other ones. Um, because it's probably easier to just text Hell yeah. Them. Then have you had DoorDash? Food. My God. <laughs> Fuck. Um, so. I, I wanted to say, there's this TikToker that I follow, the trans handy ma'am. <gasps> I love I her. I love her. I'm like obsessed with Honestly, her. Honestly, I, I unclogged my fo- sink because of her. Thank you. I've start, I started following her when she only had a few followers. Yeah. And I was like, this is going somewhere. This yeah. is interesting. And I was yeah. like, Wow, like, you know, and she blew up. Uh-huh. And I just love her. And her laugh is so her goofy. Her, her laugh is so goofy. Yes, it is. I would love to interview for her. For and she, time. like, almost gets no hate. Out. I would love to. She almost gets no hate. Like, her she comment does, section. Yeah. Lot, but the way she handles it is, it's like, beautiful. So, she's like, always classy. very positive. Yes. And she's uh, on YouTube now. So she's doing longer videos on YouTube. I fucking really love her. Need that full yeah. tutorial truly like i went to her page and was like my fucking sink is clogged what am i supposed to do with this if it's not like yeah you know and she was like do this thing and blah 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 and, and i was she, like oh my God. yeah and i was like that actually really works yes <laughs> i fucking love her i would love to reach you should reach out to her and see if she'll i can reach out to her you should reach i'll I mean, reach because like i just she I'm might just, be a little too big for us now well i just I just would, I just would yeah. like, hey girl, like, it's just, I'm a fan, I'm a fan. You be, might be fan. too starstruck, honestly. I might be, I might be. Also, she does fucking great makeup. Yeah, she's cute, yeah. she's funny. Anyway, that's my fan girl. <laughs> I would love to say that I love that story, but you know, every, every pride, if you, if you go back to last year's yeah. pride, my story was just, I'm still damaged over that. Yeah. I did this Araujo. No, that, Araujo. Was like that was like two years ago, that was a couple years ago. ago. That was two. How many years have we been podcasting? We're going on three. Yeah. Stop that shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're still not freaking retired. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do your damn job. <laughs> Didn't you say last year that you were an LGBT sympathizer? <laughs> she said that in a text message today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She like I heard that. I was like, oh, my. <laughs> she said it today in a text message. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to. I was like, did she just not solve the wound? <laughs> of all the things that she could remember, that would be one. Thing that I, oh, I remember that episode. Because I, I remember the most vivid. Because I was just like, oh man, mom. I meant Ella. No, I know you meant Ella. She's almost in the you know what we love her anyway because she puts her foot in her mouth constantly but it's all right she She means well her heart's in the right place she's pre-diabetic leave her alone (laughs) her sugar might be low (laughs) great um so that's it for us and i guess we'll see you next week hopefully we'll see you next week. hopefully we'll see you next week if you're in kenya pen, pen, what the hell is happening in kenya yeah we're, we're getting quite a few listens out someone listen kenya. loves us in kenya oh, wow. <laughs> it's and it's more than one person yeah it's very <laughs> weird one person. It's well crazy. hey kenya we're into it man can you believe it <laughs> <laughs> they they have just turned us off thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> um, we got a, a couple good reviews. Is this what you're giving me? Uh, listen, yeah. I'm pen. I I feel a review from Kenya just like brewing. It's coming. Not after my joke. I, no, not after your dad joke. <laughs> Natalie does not represent the podcast. <laughs> just like, yes. Um, talking shit literature. I, I really like that. Of course you do. Um, it says two of my favorite things: food and true crime. 
<laughs> Love the show. That's sweet, simple, and to the point. To That's the, point. the kind of review that we want. Or write a book. It's fine. Uh, yeah, we don't hate some it. Some of them are great books. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we'll see you next week. But in the meantime, you can subscribe so you don't miss out. We have about 139 episodes. 130. It's, a lo- it's up there. We're up there, yeah. Uh, and and some of the early episodes have two two count them uh and then we just kind of just we change the format listen yeah, the, it, don't come for us yeah uh so write a review and share with someone you love or hate i mm-hmm. mean depending on how you you know feel about Apparent, the yeah where you land on this podcast yeah you can connect with us on facebook instagram twitter the, the tiktok all of that the, the, YouTube. Any social media, you yeah, guessed wherever it. Wherever the things, you know, if you really feel like cringe, like you want to watch some cringe, go mm. over to TikTok. That's where you're Or don't. Cringe. Don't bother. <laughs> it's, it's real unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually really unfortunate. Uh, we will check you out next week. And remember, do not get taken to that second location. Be good or be good at hiding a body. Bye. Are you okay? Oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> 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 You're disgusting, and I hate you both. Oh, God. Oh, my God.